Okay, so this is uh, lecture 13. Okay, and uh, so what did we see uh, last class? So the last class, uh, I think, was talking about probability of error for MPAM. Okay, so we did probability of error. And uh, well, this worked out approximately to be 2q. Is that a question? Is it okay? He's still asking you something. Is there a question? You're okay? It's the guy right behind Dinesh. Did you have a question? You're okay. All right. So, so there was a, when the way I wrote it down, I said why this should be root and not by 2. Is that fine? Right? And from the way the energy of the signal, the energy of the signal was related to D and the energy of the noise was related to N naught. So we could define a simple SNR. Okay, I defined that SNR in a specific way. Once you define that SNR, this works out to be Q what square root of three times SNR divided by m squared minus one. Okay, so that's how the SNR uh, work the probability of error worked out for us. And then we defined a normalized SNR. That was just for convenience. But uh, we saw this is a good enough. Uh, approximation. It's not a very bad approximation at all. Okay, so and it works out uh, very well. Okay, and uh, I think I don't know if I completed the m squared q a m thing. Maybe I did it. Did I do it? I completed the m squared q a m. Okay, so this uh, this also worked out to something very very similar except for a some factors of two. So I think this worked out as q root three times s n r by 2m squared minus 1. Am I right? Okay. So this is how this worked out. Okay. So m squared qam is nothing but 2 mpams and it simply worked out as 2 times roughly. Okay. So there's a by 2 there. It's a 3 dB, 3 dB penalty you pay for doing that. Okay. So that's roughly m squared qam. So for MRE PSK, for instance, for MPSK, a similar derivation becomes complicated because because it doesn't split into independent real and imaginary parts, you have to actually deal with the two-dimensional Gaussian PDF and integrate. Okay, so it's not a very easy simplification to do, and we won't do it. I'll simply write down the final expression after a lot of approximations. You'll see final expression will work out to two times Q root sine squared pi by m. Okay, times SNR. Okay, so remember what is my MPSK constellation? It's uh, it's on the circle. Okay, and uh, I'm going to take the radius of the circle to be square root of ES. Why would I do that? Then my average energy is going to be ES, which is what I wanted. Okay, and then I can define once again my average uh, noise uh, power or energy as N naught by two. And then my SNR would once again become ES by EM, which is the same, which is a comparable quantity across different uh, constellations. Okay, so this this thing is on this circle. We have a lot of points. Okay, so this angle would be what? What would be this angle? 2 pi by m. So this is my constellation. For that, apparent, this if you work work it out, if you work out all the expressions for probability of error, you will get this. Okay, sine squared pi by m SNR. Okay, so now I want to compare these expressions and make some claims about how good is PSK when compared to QAM or PAM. Okay, so the first impulse looking at the expressions is to compare MPSK and MPAM. Okay, so I'm going to argue first of all that it's not a fair comparison. Why is it not a fair comparison? Yes, no, maybe, maybe you can compare. There's nothing wrong in comparing it. But MPAM is real in baseband, right? 
and MPSK is not real in baseband. So technically MPSK is already using double the bandwidth of uh, PAM. So it's not a good comparison. But M squared PSK and M squared QAM, I can very well compare. So in terms of what I'm doing in baseband and what bandwidth I'm using, M squared PSK and M squared QAM are going to give me a very good comparison. There's no problems. And we can compare and see how that works. Out. Okay, so let's let's try to do that. So if you look at so the way we do it, you'll see it's it's, it's a little bit interesting. So I'll do it also on, on the on the graph, but I'll first do it with the expressions, and then I'll relate it into a graph. Okay. So let's look at m squared PSK versus m squared QAM. Okay, so 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 let me write down the probability of error expressions because I wrote it for MPSK, the M squared PSK is going to be slightly different. So the probability of error, okay, so for M squared QAM works out to I'll say equal to, you know, it's all approximate and up to certain three by two M squared minus one SNR. Okay, and probability of error for m squared PSK is going to be what? 2 times Q square root sine squared pi by m squared SNR. Okay, so the first thing I'll say is this 2 and 4 multiplying the Q outside will not sh even show up on my plot. If I plot log of PE versus SNR and DB, okay, this 4 and 2 outside, you can't even see it on the plot, right? So, maybe in the log scale 1 to 2 is a reasonable jump from 2 to 3 and 4 and all that, there's really no, it's no significant uh, thing. So, you can't, can't see anything, right? So, that's, it's not a big deal. So, we'll ignore that part pretty much and then we'll ask the question. So, we'll assume, so, so we'll ignore this differences, okay? So, we'll say this we'll ignore. Now, I'm going to ask the question. Suppose these two probabilities of errors are equal, okay, right? Suppose these two have to be equal, okay? What SNR do I need for m squared QAM and what SNR do I need for m squared PSK? And I'm going to compare those two things, okay? So that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to say suppose PE m squared QAM equals PE m squared psk okay what at snr q here and at snr some p here okay so so what am i doing here if you, if you plot both these pe's on the same graph versus snr i'll get two different curves i'm fixing myself at one point on the y axis then i'm asking the question where do i get the intersections on the x axis okay so what are the two snrs at which these things are achieved okay so if you do that what should i do I should simply equate what's what's inside the square root as an argument of q. Okay, so it's enough if I do that. So this will happen if 3 by 2 m squared minus 1 SNR q equals sine squared pi by m squared times SNR p. Okay, right? So we've been doing so many approximations, so we might as well approximate sine. Okay, for large m, so pi is pi is just three, close to three. So large m sine pi by m square is going to be what? Pi by m square. So you square that, you get pi squared by m power four. Okay, so you do all that, then you'll see SNR q divided by. Should I do SNR p divided by SNR q, or which is a better? I think SNR p is better. Okay, so we'll do we'll do that. SNR P divided by SNR Q will work out to roughly uh, 3m squared by 2 pi squared. Okay. Okay, so it's an approximate calculation. Right. So you have to take m to be a power of 2. Okay. So first thing to take is m equals 2. If you take m equals 2, you know 4 pim and 4 psk have to be exactly identical there's no difference between the two right 
Do you agree or not? 4 pm and 4 psk are exactly the same. There's no difference. But since we did a lot of approximation here, you won't get the exact equals. Okay, so but but it's almost the same. What is pi? If you take pi to be three, right? Maybe it's roughly almost the same if you put m equals to. Okay, so you have some problems there, but it's okay. It's just an approximation all over the place. But as m becomes larger, our approximation is going to be more and more true, right? For m equals two, pi by four is definitely sine pi by four is the it's probably far away from pi by four reasonably far away. So it's not a good approximation. So if you go to m equals 4 for instance, okay, then this becomes a very good approximation. m equals 4, m equals 6, 8, m equals 16 and on that it becomes better and better. Okay, So if you plot this versus m, okay, m 2, 4, 8, I have only 3 points. For 2 it works out to be 0 dB. Okay, If you do the accurate plot, it will work out to be 0 dB. For 4 it works out to be roughly around some 4.2 db okay for 8 it's around 10 db okay what do these numbers mean okay okay so if 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 i compare 16 qam with 16 psk i get the same probability of error for 16 qam at 4.2 db better than 16 psk okay right what happens in 64 QAM and 64 PSK? It's 10 dB better. Okay, the same probability of error is roughly a point, a 10 dB better point. Okay, so well, I've done a dB conversion as well. I mean, if you do if you plug it in, you'll get some number you have to convert to dB. Okay, so maybe this is not a good expression to use. You can even directly use the sine expression if you want. It's not a big deal. Okay, so so these are the things that you can do. When you, when you, so you see, so you see, this is this is one part of digital communication, if you will. You know, I mean, you draw a constellation, compute the decision regions, compute the probability of error, then make some comparisons at that level and decide which is a good constellation. Okay, so here we are roughly deciding that QAM is better, but what advantage does PSK have over QAM? Okay, the envelope is very constant. Okay, so constant envelope is always better. Okay, and from so many points of view and design. Okay, so in practice maybe that is better, but today, I mean, analog digital design has evolved to a stage where pretty much QAM is okay. It's not a big deal. You don't have to worry so much about QAM, and QAM is almost a de facto standard. Okay, except in very very low power devices that you want to use, QAM is pretty much a de facto standard today. Okay, and you see there's an advantage over PSK in terms of uh, probability of error. Okay. So this kind of a calculation is interesting and you should know how to do it for any two arbitrary constellations. Suppose I give you two different constellations and then I ask you to find out which is better and what is the actual gain at a pro fixed uh, probability of error. You should be capable of doing all these approximations and coming up to that. Okay? So maybe I won't expect you to know the 2D Gaussian integration and all that. So that approximation is slightly more difficult. But to the extent possible, you should be able to approximate it and come up with some number like 1 dB, 2 dB, you shouldn't give a complicated integration expression and say go evaluate it. Okay, that doesn't make much sense. Okay. So at some level you should be able to do it. Alright, so that's uh, it's about uh, PSK and uh, QAM. Okay, so a so couple of loose ends which we haven't really uh, looked at closely before winding up this part and moving on to strictly band limited type uh, situations and I want to use maximum bandwidth. I'll go to that soon enough, but before that I want to just finish up a few things. One thing I didn't do is, how do you come up with what is called MQAM when M is a power of 2? Okay, so we did not do this yet, right? What did we do? We did only M squared QAM where M is a power of 2. So those kind of constructions are called rectangular square QAM, I think. Okay, so maybe rectangular QAM. So M squared QAM is a very square case, right? So I think it's square QAM, okay? So when you have other powers, odd powers of 2, okay, 8, 32, 128 and so on, you have the rectangular QAM case. Okay, So you'll see it's, it's not a big deal. You just try to pick points, enough points around to get, uh, get what you want. But even this is becoming less fashionable these days. If you look at the latest even wireless standards, people will do 4, 16, 64, 256. You know, they just tend to avoid the middle points because it just complicates matters. Okay. Right? So there's lots of advantage in doing m, m squared QAM, the x and y axis become independent. You can do so many, so many things uh, in a much more uh, free fashion. 
Okay, so I'll do I'll do this uh, just for completeness. You'll see how it works. Okay, so if M is four, we know what it is. Okay, it is a case we considered already. M is two, I'm not doing. Okay, so it's not really QAM anymore. So it's just <coughs> PAM. So M is four. You have a simple constellation. What do you do for M equals eight? What do you think you can do? Yeah, you can do anything you want. Pretty much, nobody's going to stop you. So you can choose. So one thing that's commonly done is either you put two points here or put two points on the y-axis. But you might say, I don't want to do it. I want to pick one point here, one point here, one point on top, one point below. Yeah, be my guest. You can do it. Okay, so it's, it's okay. If you find that that is easy for you, you can do that also. Okay, but this is a very standard 8QAM constellation. So if you see people talking about 8QAM, they're usually talking about this constellation. Okay, so 16 is once again easy. Okay. I'll do 32 also on top of 16. So you'll see, six, I'll do 16 first, and then I'll show you how to do 32. It's, it's quite easy. Just pick points around the 16 QAM constellation till you get 32. Okay. One, this is 16. Okay. So I'll, I'll draw a dotted line here to show that this is 16. Okay. So this is 16. And for 32, I'll do this. This is again a standard thing to do to get 32. I'll pick four points here. Then I'll I'll pick four points here. What am I leaving out? I'm leaving out that corner point. Okay, so then I'll pick four points here. Once again, I'll pick four points here. Okay, and then one can join all these guys with a dotted line. Together, now I get 32 QAM. What was, uh, is it, is it, does it make any logical sense to you dropping out the corner points? Why would I drop out the corner points? Sorry? Yeah, th those are the maximum energy points, right? right? See why the corner points have maximum energy? Is, the distance is maximum from the origin. So they have a lot of energy. So if at all you want to drop something, you'll be better off dropping maximum energy points. Okay? So this is a standard trick you can use. In fact, you can automate this process. Okay? So you keep picking. 1, 3, 5, 7, so on on the x-axis, same thing on the y-axis and look at the square grid and then drop maximum energy points till you get to the number of points you want. Okay, So that can be like a general algorithm for coming up with mqam even if m is not a power of 2. Okay, so you might say why do you want to pick m not a power of 2? Maybe maybe for exam questions it's a good thing to pick. Okay, So maybe for those kind of things one can do uh, those things. Okay, so 64 would be square once again, right? So 8 on each x and y. 128 would be non-square again. So you just keep picking more points and fill out the square grid and then drop the maximum energy points till you get 128. So you would get a nice 128 there. Okay, so that's how you proceed for uh, these things. All right, so this is one part which I didn't clearly talk, but you can do that. So what will be one of the complications in say uh, 32 QAM and all that? Okay, decision regions will be a little bit more involved, but one can do it. It's not a big problem. You can do it. But there's also approximations to the probability of error for a general MQAM. Okay, I'm not talking much about. Okay, so other things which I have not talked at all about is there are other signaling schemes. Which were popular and I think which are popular among particularly the low power communication devices. So, so you might say, what is this low power communication device? So usually when you think of sensors and all that, so what sensors you have to imagine are sensing some physical quantity like temperature, whatever, pressure and all that. And you want to put it over a large geographical area and leave it unattended kind of, you know, I mean, then you may, then maybe you fly an aircraft over it and try to read information from the sensors. Okay. So you can't maintain the sensors. So you can't change the battery every so often. So you want to use very little power from the sensor. So for those kind of things, you want to put a very simple communication uh, uh, system out there. For those kind of things, maybe something else makes sense. Okay. So the problem with QAM is, one of the significant problems in detecting QAM is, it needs to be coherent for getting good performance and all that. There are other schemes which give you good non-coherent detectors. So FSK for instance is a very popular scheme, which you can think of in this picture also. But FSK is a popular scheme which allows a non-coherent detector. Okay. I haven't talked much about it. but Maybe later on, if we have time, we'll do it. Okay, so there are two types here. One uh, that I left out. One I'll call. One is typically called continuous phase modulation. Okay. 
okay it's also called cpm okay so so if you don't like the likes of prakash karat and other people you may want to avoid this also okay the other is fsk for instance i mean i think i talked about fsk but i didn't do it in great detail okay so there's another version of it called cp fsk okay it's continuous phase fsk so this continuous phase is a was is considered one more thing which is useful in electronics from an analog electronics point of view but but today once again it's not a big deal okay so if you don't even if you don't have continuous phase in your signal people can deal with it so so it's not gone out of fashion okay so the cpm has several um, i almost said factions to it it's not faction several different types one is called msk it's called minimum shift keying okay so another one is offset qpsk okay so all these things are different uh, schemes which i have not talked at all about but if you pick any standard textbook on digital communication all these things will be elaborated okay so you might want to read through and understand what this cpms and fsk and cpfsk all right so the last uh, last piece of missing information is labeling points with bits okay that is something i did not talk about okay so that's one thing and one more thing i did not talk about is bit error rate okay so far we have been only dealing with symbol error rates right so what is the probability that my received symbol is not equal to my transmitted symbol okay so from symbols i have to go back to bits and that might cause some differences as far as error rates are concerned so those two things i'll quickly talk about okay so one very popular way of labeling points with bits is what's called gray coding okay so the logic in gray coding is adjacent points must differ only in one bit differ in one bit okay so it's possible to do this for all for almost all of our uh, signaling schemes okay so adjacent points should differ only in one bit so you start with a very simple 4 pam okay so okay so you have four points okay how do you label so that adjacent points differ in one bit so you can't do sequential that's the only thing you can't do you can't do 0 0 0 1 1 0 1 1 so because 0 1 and 1 0 differ in two places so all you have to do is 0 0 0 1 1 1 1 0 it's a small uh, change to it okay so you can also do 8 pam okay so i'll just there are in fact there are several ways of doing gray coding this is not one way of doing any gray coding right you for instance if you flip this or you rotate it anything you do will maintain all of these things okay so so those there are several ways of doing it this is just one way and most in most cases you can just by trial and error figure out what the gray coding is right? so, so you don't have to have any great theoretical algorithm in your mind to do this so for instance 8 pam okay so there are four points on the side four points on the side okay so what shall we begin with we'll begin with 0 0 what can i do next 0 0 1 what can i do next 0 1 1 okay what can i do next 0 1 0 okay what can i do next 1 1 0 okay 1 1 1 okay 1 0 1 1 0 okay so this is so like i said i mean there's no real confusion there are enough bits enough uh, length three bits so you can just keep playing around with it and eventually you will get to the gray code it's not a big deal okay so 16 qam maybe is a little bit more interesting okay so we'll do that next what is the logic behind doing gray code i'll come to that soon. so right now i'm just using it as one way of coding you might choose any other logic if you want but i'll come to it soon okay so you have 16 points okay so how do you think you should do it this time you look at it, it might be scary but just start somewhere and keep going 
Okay, so for 2D things, it's good to split it into two bits first and then do the two bits and then do the remaining two bits. Okay, so it always works out that way. So maybe I can try, uh, I can try what? I'll try, I'll try the last two bits here, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. Okay, and then the first two bits, I'll keep the same for all four. Okay, and then what can I do? I can do a gray code for the first two bits column wise. Okay, so I'll do 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. Okay, so and then retain the same 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Is it okay? Okay, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. And then I do one zero zero one one zero one 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 zero one. Okay, so this is just once again one way of doing gray coding in 16 km. You might want to do any other way. Okay, so what's the logic once again? The one of the perceived advantages of gray coding is okay, one of the easily intuitive understandings is suppose you transmit one symbol. Okay, what is your most likely erroneous symbol going to be? The next one, right? So that's one simple error. Anyway, you made an error. But when you make that one simple error, how many bit errors would you make? Only one if you did gray coding. Okay. But maybe it doesn't matter in many cases. Okay. But in some cases, it might matter for you to minimize the bit error rate given that you made a simple error. Okay. So, so if you're looking at such kind of things, if those things make sense to you, then you might want to do it. But actually, it turns out today people do something called coded modulation. Suppose you do coding and modulation together. Something like gray coding has very deep benefits. Okay, there are some benefits because of gray coding fundamentally. Okay, so those things one one might one might say it's still a research type topic. Okay, so people are still working on it. There are a lot of advantages here. Maybe if we have time towards the end, we'll see some of these things. Okay, so but gray coding is something good. You might also do other things. It's not a big deal. Okay, ultimately we'll see simple error and bit error are very closely. They have to be very close. They can't be too far off. Okay, after all, you're taking just log m base two bits. And mapping it to a symbol. Okay, it can't be two way off. Okay, we'll do that also later. So, okay, so but I want to point out that there are other labeling schemes out there and other, uh, in fact, other ways of doing, multiple ways of doing gray coding itself. Okay, so all these things have their own advantages. There is one thing called set partitioning, which is also considered a very good way of doing labeling. Okay, so which is again, again, something that one can look at. Okay, so this I did just for completeness. So that you have a way of doing uh, this. Okay, so the last, uh, well, the last and final thing I'm going to do is uh, look at symbol errors versus bit errors. Okay, so it's very simple. I'll do it for MQAM. You'll see it's it's a relatively simple idea. I'll just quickly go through it without any problem. So here's an intuitive way of thinking about it without going into the rigorous probabilities and all that. Okay, if you make one symbol error in MQAM, what can happen in terms of bit errors? Okay, there are several possibilities, right? If you, if you if you if I tell you that the symbol I received is not the symbol I transmitted, right? Each symbol corresponds to log m base two bits. So next question to ask is how many bit errors did I make? What are the possible answers? Okay, zero is not a possibility because I already told you I made an error. Okay, so it can go from one to log m base two. So this can result in either one bit error and all the way to log m base two bit errors. Okay, so this is the intuitive basis for what we'll be doing next. Okay, suppose I say now I transmit n symbols. Okay. And because of, and this is a result of the transmission and detection, I made n sub s symbol errors. Suppose this happened. Okay. So now if, if I look at the bits picture, when I transmitted n symbols, how many bits did I transmit? N times log m base 2 bits were transmitted. And how many bit errors did I make? I can't be sure, but roughly it will be between well, it will definitely be between ns bit errors and ns times log m base 2 
bitterness. Okay, so this is the possibility. So now, in this situation, my symbol error rate worked out to what? Assuming all these numbers are really, really large, I'm doing it for a long time. My symbol error rate will roughly be n s by n, right? What will be my bit error rate? Well, I can't be sure, but I can bound it. I know at best, at worst, it will be ns by n and at best it will be ns by n log m base 2 okay right so this is the this is this is very true one can also show it very rigorously if you want probability of bit error is bounded between probability of symbol error and probability of symbol error divided by number of bits per symbol okay so it's a very simple uh, intuitive uh, thing to remember. So if I look at a case where everything is going to zero, if I force everything to zero, then it doesn't matter. If symbol error rate goes to zero, bit error rate will also go to zero okay, because it's sandwiched in between. Okay, so that's the that's the logic. All right, so we don't have to worry too much about the distinction between bit errors and symbol errors. You can look one on any one thing and build a build a certain result, and that will also be valid typically for bit error rates. Okay, so that's, uh, I think that pretty much ties up our uh, loose ends. I want to briefly summarize where we are and then move to the next uh, logical step. Okay, so here's a summary. Okay, remember, so far we've been looking at an ideal AWGN channel, but also very large bandwidth. Okay. So I've been trying to emphasize this very large bandwidth. How did I, why, where did I make that assumption of very large bandwidth? Okay. Yeah, so as I was saying my signals are going to have start at zero and end at T. Okay, so once I say that, my bandwidth is going to be very, very large and I'll have to receive that signal. So I'm assuming my bandwidth is very large there. Okay, so because of that assumption, everything worked out properly for me. Okay, so if I didn't make that assumption, so many things would not have worked out. So because of that, I could pick my basis in a very simple way. Okay, I can simply window the basis and pick it. Okay, so so the first thing we spent some time understanding is the equivalence between real base band and okay one of the very crucial things and complex pass band. Okay, so this is a very very uh, okay sorry <laughs> real pass band and complex baseband okay this equivalence is very very crucial and how did we go back and forth by up conversion and down conversion by multiplying suitably okay you have to take a real part root 2 times and all these things okay so that can that was a that was one of the most uh, important concepts that were introduced in this context okay so real base pass band and complex baseband and that's that's very usual useful okay and uh, so what else did we do okay and then we assumed that the bandwidth i have is much much larger than 1 by t okay so what is t now okay so once once i assumed this i was able to pick a very simple signaling scheme okay so signaling became very very simple because of this in what sense okay i can now pick just one basis function phi of t okay which is what which is simply constant between 0 and t say 1 by root t okay and then what can i let every other signal to be if i want to send anything else simple multipli multiplication of this okay the reason why i was able to do this is because since my bandwidth is much much larger than 1 by t i know that this signal will come through unaffected no problem it won't it will exactly come through as it is okay and if i now send another symbol after that, what will happen? That will also come through exactly, right? So I can even string symbol after symbol in this way and get them faithfully at the other end because I have enough bandwidth. Okay, I assumed a huge bandwidth was there. So even if I send symbol after symbol, none of them will cause any problem. So I can repeat this for every 0 to t and I will get it. Okay, so in practice, if your bandwidth is not, not very large, what would you do? 
yeah just increase the t you keep on sending it for a long time till you are sure that it will definitely come through okay so don't change it too fast okay so that so so this is a this is definitely an implementable scheme for any system except that you won't be using the bandwidth optimally okay so we did that signaling was simple and i want to write down how that signaling worked out okay so this is how this complex baseband qam worked out for us okay so we started with b which was 2 times log m base 2 bits okay this is going to give me what what is the first step the way we picture it what do you take the bits and then pick a point from my constellation okay so it gives me this a plus jb which is a point in the constellation then what do you do you multiply this a plus jb by this basis to get my complex baseband signal okay this is my complex baseband signal then what do i do i up convert okay so once i do up conversion i get my real pass band signal xabt okay so this is going to go through some additive noise and i receive something and then what do i do i do down conversion to get something and then i do a correlation receiver in this case the correlation simply becomes an integrate and dump you have to integrate over a long time to make sure you are within the bandwidth and all that but this becomes an integrate and dump there's no problem okay so it's actually it comes from we know that this is the optimal thing to do from the correlation receiver ideas okay so we know the optimum receiver has to do the correlation and which worked out to this so once you do integrate and dump what do you get you in fact get a plus jb plus noise okay two dimensional noise and what is the pdf of this noise iid normal mean zero variance n0 by 2 what is this n0 by 2 psd of the n of t okay so so in our model what do we do we jump directly from here to here for probability of error calculation and all that but you can choose to jump from anywhere to anywhere right so go in this scheme anywhere and see the correspondence but for various calculations some things are easy so here then you do a detection okay and your detection is Okay, the various types possible MAP, ML, but the simplest thing is what? Minimum distance. Okay, and whether it's optimal or not depends on several conditions, but that might be okay. Okay, and you get your B hat. Okay, so this is the picture that we've been looking at so far. Okay, and we did several calculations with it. We tried to convince ourselves that it works and it, it's good enough. And uh, people who are doing 471, this might be a first cut model too. implement and and see whether it works or not okay so that's a very simple uh, nice model all right so now we have to start using the bandwidth better okay so you might say why do i want to use the bandwidth better for one you might want a faster rate of communication okay given a certain bandwidth you might want for instance the maximum rate at which you can communicate okay if such a thing exists okay so there are all so there are some several problems with that so once you do that once you say i'm going to occupy a lot of bandwidth what will happen what will happen one of the crucial things that will happen is i can't just think of each of these symbols separately okay so right now i can run this continuously why i can send the first symbol wait till 0 to t and then send the second symbol and i know i'll receive all of them properly and my entire thing will work because my bandwidth is so large compared to this 1 by t i know everything is going to go through there's no problem now if i start occupying larger and larger bandwidths or decreasing t okay so i'm increasing my bandwidth first thing that will note that will happen is right what what do you think will happen first thing that will happen is one symbol will spill over into the other symbol okay so i'll i'll maybe draw another picture and show you how it can happen so as you guys you keep occupying more and more bandwidth okay so your your time for the signal is becoming shorter and shorter right so for right so before the first symbol kind of dies out and it's enough you'll be starting the next one okay so eventually 
you will have spillover from one symbol to another. So you have to worry about continuous operation. Okay, that's the first thing you have to worry about. Okay, when you go and want to fill up your bandwidth and occupy a lot of the bandwidth and communicate at a faster rate with limited bandwidth, when you do that, you have to worry about continuous operation. You have to look at one symbol to, to the other. Okay, so that will be one significant change that will happen. But beyond that, most of the things will be similar. The same model we'll try to carry over. Okay, so we will not drop this correspondence between real pass band and complex base band. It's really useful to us. We want to retain it. We will not suddenly drop the signal constellation. We will still retain it. Okay, we will not drop this view of signal space, correlation receiver and detection principle. We will not drop all, all of that. All of them will be the same. We will try to manage with the same type of setup but change some things crucially here and there and try to make the same thing work. And you will see it is possible. Okay, definitely for ideal AWGN band limited channels you can do it with very simple changes. When you do not have an ideal channel you have to do more tweaks but it is possible. Okay, so that is where we are headed in the next few classes. Okay, so the next thing we will do is we will look at what are we doing next? Ideal band limited AWGN, not really large bandwidth. I don't have too many, ba too much bandwidth to burn. Okay, so that's the next thing we'll see. Okay, once again, there are two ways of viewing it. I'm saying band limited. Well, any system is really band limited. But what did I do in the previous scenario? I did not use all my band, I used a very small bandwidth. Okay, So now there are two ways of viewing it, I will either say I want to occupy all the bandwidth or signal at a very fast rate, I want I want those constraints, Okay, those conditions, those conditions are are important. Okay, So right now, so, the re so, so you see uh, what was missing in the previous picture was this trade off, the bandwidth never really entered the picture because I assumed I am not going to worry about it, now we are bringing bandwidth in, Okay, so that will give us a nice complete picture of the entire trade off between bandwidth, power, probability of error, noise power and everything. Okay, So, this will kind of complete the picture. Okay, So, this is ideal band limited AWGN. So, what is the picture that I am going to have? Uh, well, so, so the old picture still remains. Okay, So, the problem I have is still the same. It is not, it's not in any way different. I have n bits which I want to transmit. So, I am going to use a transmitter and put out some xb of t which is going to go through a channel okay and i'll get a y of t which i want the receiver to pro process and get a b hat okay okay so this is my picture and uh, how am i going to model the channel i'm once again I'm going to model the channel with an impulse response h of t Okay, and that impulse response will correspond to a Fourier transform H of F. Okay, so now I might either have a pass band channel or a base band channel. Okay, right? Both possibilities are there. My channel could be either a pass band channel or a base band channel. What do I mean by that? At my disposal, I either have a bandwidth which is in pass band or base band. Okay, usually in wireless and all that, you always have pass band. Okay, so, but in wireline, in some situations, it's possible to imagine having a baseband channel. Okay, So, but I am going to say my channel right now is ideal. What do we mean by ideal? Within that band, it is flat. H of f is flat. That is what I mean by ideal. Whatever bandwidth I have, within that bandwidth, my channel is flat. Okay, So, that is my assumption. Okay, So, so if you think of H of f, since it is flat, maybe if you say pass band, okay, it is pass band, then it is going to be some w frequency in pass band. So, if you since it's since I'm going to say H of T is real and all that, it will also have a W on the negative side. So, I know if I think of down conversion, I can down convert this pass band real channel response into a complex envelope equivalent. If I do that, what will be my H tilde of F? It's going to be between minus W by 2 and w by 2 and since I am assuming it is ideal, right? what will be the h tilde of t? That will also be real. Okay. So, you see the complex baseband picture actually becomes a real baseband picture so, because of my ideal channel assumption. So, I do not have to worry too much about complex in this case. Okay.
okay so i might as well take without lo losing any generality about the channel a real baseband impulse response okay since since my channel is ideal that is good enough okay so that doesn't mean my xb of t will be real okay on this is only for h of t okay why will my xb of t still still have to be complex yeah but i still want to use the entire bandwidth if it's pass band channel right i want to use the entire bandwidth which will make which will mean i have to make my xb xb of t still complex so that when it goes to pass band i will be using the entire bandwidth so my xb of t can still be complex but i'm going to say since it's ideal my h of t will be base band real okay so i can make that assumption because even if it is pass band real it's going to be base band real anyway and base band i'm assuming it's ideal so it's all ideal so without loss of generality we'll take h of t to be base band real okay so when i introduce non ideal channels maybe that at that point you'll have to assume h of t can be base band complex okay so but still base band is good enough okay because i know i can down convert and view the whole thing in base band okay so that's the first uh, thing we'll do okay all right so now this is this is uh, this is simple it's not too not too bad so let me go back and look at requirements on xb of t okay so 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 did i have the picture here okay so let me just cut and paste this picture i don't want to once again draw this so oh, i'm running out of time so let me see okay all right so so this is my picture now and my h of t what am i going to assume my h of t to be i'm going to say h of t is base band real okay so i can do that without any real problems here because of my ideal assumption okay so once i do that so what should my xb of t necessarily be okay so the first constraint you need is yeah it has to be band limited between minus w by 2 and w by 2 okay also i want to be able to repeat this right i mean i want to do it at a reasonable time so xb of t should also have finite support it should also be time limited okay so this xp of t is seemingly i mean the requirement is it has to be both time limited and and band limited okay band limited between minus w by 2 w by 2 time limited say say maybe 0 to tn okay some tn okay so i'm picking that to be some time limit okay we know definitely that these two are strictly fully rigorously not satisfiable so we'll satisfy them only approximately okay so usually the time limit is strictly satisfied because you know in your system you can't keep transmitting one one signal forever okay so time limit is strictly satisfied which means the band limitation will only be approximately satisfied so approximation in the sense to an arbitrary accuracy say for instance outside of w by 2 the spectrum will go down to say minus 50 db minus 40 db minus 30 db whatever some very low number so that you're not interfering with anybody else who wants to use that spectrum okay so outside of w by 2 my spectrum will have to drop down to really really low that will be my that will be the way i'll be enforcing this <coughs> this limitation but usually like i said time limitation is will have to be strictly enforced okay so today that's how people do it all right so that's the that's the first point to note but the second point is more critical okay there's another requirement on xb of t which comes because of the requirement of continuous operation okay so what is the sec second requirement this is the this is uh, this is because of continuous operation and we'll see it in the next class okay okay the fact that i want to send the next symbol as well i send the first symbol first set of n bits then i want to send the next set of n bits as well and if i'm using a lot of bandwidth i'm going to get interference between these two signals and how do i avoid that is it possible and all that is what we'll look at next okay so because of continuous operation we get that we'll see that beginning next class